if you want to learn everything you need to know as a nurse about hyperkalemia, then this is the video for you. Hyperkalemia is the medical term to describe a higher than normal potassium level in your blood. The normal potassium range is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Therefore, anything greater than 5 milliequivalents per liter is considered hyperkalemia. Potassium is an important cation responsible for nerve and muscle cell function, including the heart. Blood concentrations of potassium are mainly regulated by the kidneys. However, the sodium potassium pump and blood pH also have a role in this. Almost all the potassium within the body is stored within cells. Only a small amount is found outside of cells, such as in the bloodstream. Hyperkalemia is the most dangerous electrolyte imbalance, as it poses a high risk for the development of life-threatening arrhythmias and cardiac arrest. The most common cause of hyperkalemia is related to decreased kidney function, such as acute or chronic kidney disease. Another common cause is due to cell destruction, resulting in the potassium stored within cells to be expelled, such as with rhabdomyolysis caused by burns or musculoskeletal trauma, hemolytic anemia, tumor lysis syndrome, serious infections, and chemotherapy medications. Blood transfusions, especially mass transfusions, may cause hyperkalemia due to the small amount of hemolysis or destruction of red blood cells that occurs while the product is stored. Metabolic acidosis also causes hyperkalemia, as excess hydrogen ions are shifted into cells in exchange for potassium to manage blood pH. Many medications can also cause hyperkalemia, such as ARBs, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, potassium sparing diuretics, digoxin, heparin, and NSAIDs. Excessive intake of potassium, especially in the presence of decreased renal function, such as TPM, IV fluid containing potassium, potassium supplements, salt substitutes, and foods rich in potassium can cause hyperkalemia. Other disease processes that may result in hyperkalemia include Addison's disease and diabetic ketoacidosis. Signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia can be split into two categories, neuromuscular and cardiac. Neuromuscular signs and symptoms include paresthesia, which is the most common, muscle weakness that can progress to flaccid paralysis, decreased deep tendon reflexes, and abdominal cramping, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting as hyperkalemia causes hyperactivity of smooth muscles. Cardiac signs and symptoms include irregular pulse, hypotension, palpitations, and various arrhythmias, some of which can be life-threatening, such as ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation, and cardiac arrest. Signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia are more severe when there is an acute shift of potassium, whereas those with chronic hyperkalemia may have no signs or symptoms at all. Hyperkalemia also presents with some ECG changes, the most common being tall peaked T waves, but also depressed P waves, widening of the QRS complex, sine wave pattern, and ventricular fibrillation. Diagnosis of hyperkalemia is usually discovered by chance during routine blood work or while investigating other complaints. It is important to note a false high or pseudo-hyperkalemia can occur if the blood sample is hemolyzed due to rough handling or collection, if the sample is collected above an IV infusion containing potassium, or collected from a recently exercised extremity. Therefore, it is important to question hyperkalemia in the absence of a cause before aggressive treatment is started. 
Aggressiveness of treatment of hyperkalemia depends on the severity. It includes stopping all exogenous sources of potassium, and medications if appropriate that may be causing hyperkalemia. Additionally, treatment usually includes an ECG to assess for changes and arrhythmias with the possibility of continuous telemetry. Intravenous calcium gluconate or chloride may be ordered to stabilize cardiac tissue. Regular insulin can be given intravenously to drive potassium into cells. However, intravenous glucose, such as dextrose 50, should be given alongside unless the patient is in a hyperglycemic state to prevent hypoglycemia. It is important to closely monitor blood sugar with this treatment. Beta-2 adrenergic agents, such as a salbutamol nebulizer, may also be administered as it touches potassium into cells, but it is not as effective as insulin. Loop or thiazide diuretics, such as Lasix, may be used as an adjacent therapy to increase clearance of potassium by the kidneys. It is important to monitor fluid volume with this therapy to prevent hypovolemia. Sodium polystyrene sulfonate, also known as k can be used to increase excretion of potassium in stool. Sodium bicarbonate can be used in metabolic acidosis to temporarily shift potassium into cells. And finally, hemodialysis may be used. However, this treatment is usually reserved for those with severe renal impairment or severe hyperkalemia resistant to other treatments. This wraps up everything you need to know, as a nurse, about hyperkalemia. I hope you found this video useful, and if you did, please show your support by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss a video. And please leave a comment down below if you have any video requests. Thank you, and bye!